Hi there, so we carry on now with chapter 13 which deals with oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion uh, refers to something oscillating or something moving to and fro. In general it refers to a motion which is periodic in nature. For example in the picture on the right we have a watch which is acting as a pendulum, you know, swinging um, to and fro. We're going to be considering an object undergoing simple harmonic motion and we're going to be interested in deriving equations for the position, the velocity and the acceleration of such an object. We're going to go on to, to define a number of concepts relating to simple harmonic motion as shown here. And then we're going to finish the chapter by deriving an equation for the energy of an object performing simple harmonic oscillation. By means of an introduction then, periodic motion is the repeating motion of an object in which it continually returns to a given position after some fixed interval of time. And the repetitive movement of this object is referred to as oscillations. If you're a geologist, you'll know about us seismic waves which are waves that travel through the earth's surface other examples are sound waves or waves on a string or waves propagating through a pond so a sound wave is a wave which travels through air uh, and this happens by the mechanism of air particles oscillating back and forth a water wave travels across a pond whereby the the elements of the water oscillate up and down and backwards and forwards. And that was actually one of the, the, the pictures on our cover slide was of a stone being dropped into a pond and it creating uh, periodic uh, disturbances in the water which leads to, to water waves and ripples that uh, radiate outwards. We consider now the case of a, a mass piece attached to a spring which is oscillating uh, backwards and forwards periodically as shown in this picture. You remember we looked at this case before we have the mass piece attached to the spring. As initially it stretched to um, this point over here and then the force of the string, the restoring force, pulls it back and the object then arrives at the zero position again uh, because it has some momentum it continues uh, moving and it moves to to the right until we reach such a point where the spring is compressed and it stops and then we all have this uh, motion uh, repeating so as i said we consider in the case where if the force is proportional to the displacement for the spring we have uh, Hooke's law which says that the force is equal to minus kx so f is proportional to x this will give rise to an object this will cause an object to return to an equilibrium position or zero uh, which give, gives rise to repeated motion in terms of repeated motion we refer to the object moving to and fro backwards and forwards Due to the momentum uh, of the object, it overshoots the zero position and the spring force again returns the object to its zero position, giving rise to repetitive motion. If repeated at regular intervals, we have uh, periodic harmonic motion. You'll remember in chapter 2 we dealt with linear motion. And we were interested in predicting the motion of an object in this moving in a straight line. That's to say, we were interested in knowing the object's position, its velocity, and its acceleration as a function of time. And we had the four equations of motion that we used to, to do that. Well, this um, a chapter that we're doing now is similar in the sense that we would also like to predict uh, the motion of an object. But in this case, it's an object undergoing simple harmonic oscillation. So it's an object that's moving, you know, backwards and forwards per periodically as time goes by, repeating its motion, moving to and fro. So in the same way, we would like to predict the, the, the position and the velocity and the acceleration 
of this object as a function of time. Uh, so if we begin to work with the mathematics and look at the equations describing the object's motion, we know already that we have Hooke's law. And Hooke's law, remember, is fs is equal to minus kx. So Hooke's law tells us that the force of the spring on the block, the force of the spring on the block is equal to minus kx, where the minus is the indication of a restoring force such that the force is always going to act towards uh, the center. The second equation that we you know, often make use of is Newton's second law, which says the sum of the forces in the x direction is you know, mass times acceleration in the x direction. If we ignore friction, then for this case, the only force acting on, on the block will be um, the force of the spring. So if we ignore friction, then the sum of the forces is just going to be the force resulting from Hooke's law. So this gives us then minus kx is mass times acceleration. Then we can simply rearrange this equation to make the acceleration the function of, of the um, equation. And this final equation shown here, this describes the acceleration of the block as a function of, of time. So remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with equations that, that um, describe the, the position, the velocity and the acceleration of, of the block. And what we already have is an expression for the acceleration of, of the block. You'll note that this expression isn't a function of time, but it's a function of the position of the block. Imagine for yourself that we redraw the, the, the block in the spring where we have a case where it's no longer oscillating in the x direction but instead we have um, the block or in this case a ball uh, oscillating in, in the y direction. So we've you know attached the spring to, to, to this point here and then we have this ball moving uh, to and fro. Imagine if we plotted its y position as a function of time. As time went by, we plotted its y position. So the, the ball may start at this position, or it may start here, and it may be on its way up. It may be moving up, 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 up to this point here. It's moving up this curve on, on our plot, moves up to this point here. Then it stops, then it begins moving down and it returns to its original position and it will continue moving in this direction it will be in the negative part of the curve now relating to to this part of the curve it will be at this position and so it will return and oscillate a uh, to and fro and you'll note that the that the shape of the of the graph that we generate the shape of the position curve with time is a cos uh, function this is a cost function, it's starting at zero, going up to, to some amplitude, then, then re, uh, returning down. There's some uh, important characteristics of this graph that we need to, to take note of. We have, you know, time is going to be along the, along the x-axis. We have the amplitude, A. When we speak about the amplitude, we speak about the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position. So this distance shown here will be the amplitude A. We have the period. The period is the time taken for one full oscillation. You can see it's starting at uh, zero here and it's moving upwards. If we look at the one full oscillation, by the time it reaches this point here, it's back at zero and it's also moving upwards. So it returned to its original state. And we refer to this time uh, as, as one full period. The period can be you know, described in, in different ways. If we start at this point here, we can see it's on its way down. So if we look at one full cycle, then it would go like such and it would return to here and then it would be going down again. So this is also one full cycle. And the time taken for, for, for this full cycle to be traced out would also be, be the period.
but let's have a look at this uh, at this quiz question. Um, a block at the end of a spring is pulled to position x equals to a and released from rest. So you can think of it being pulled, you know, perhaps uh, downwards to, to this point here and then released from rest. In one full motion, um, uh, in one full cycle of its motion, through what total distance does it travel? Does it travel half a? Does it travel a, 2a or 4a? Well, let's have a look. If we, you know, think of it being pulled down to, to this point here, they say that would represent a, a distance A, and then it's released. And now what we're interested in, how far is it going to travel through full, through, how far is it going to travel for what, in one full cycle of its motion? So one full cycle would involve it starting here, moving to the equilibrium position. That would be a distance A, right? Moving up to the top here, which would be another A, so this is 2A. Moving back down, that would be then 3A. And finally, returning uh, to its starting position over here, that would be 4A. So in one full cycle of its motion, it moves through a total distance of 4A, which is the solution. So it comes about that in our physics, we often make in use of trigonometric functions. We often make in use of sine and cos. And what we're interested to do, to do now is to know how to differentiate um, trigonometric functions. And the way we're gonna approach it is in a very like intuitive way. And uh, we're gonna figure out what the derivative should be. The first function we're gonna look at is sine of theta. So what I've drawn is um, I've drawn a graph of uh, sine of theta as shown. And what we're interested to calculate or find out is what is the derivative of sine of theta? So what is d theta of sine of theta? Well, if we, if we look at that, then on an intuitive level, we know that a derivative is a gradient at uh, every point. And you can note that, of course, for our function sine of theta, the gradient is going to be changing. If we take a look at zero, at theta equals to zero, so this point here, what is the gradient at that point? Well, to find the gradient, it's, you know, a line that's a tangent to that point and a tangent to, to sine of theta at zero is going to be one. So that means that at theta equals to zero, um, sine of theta has a gradient of one. So in the graph below, we're going to plot the derivative. Then what happens is as we, as we move um, along this point here, the gradient decreases, decreases, decreases until we get to, to the point where theta equals 90 degrees. And at this point, the gradient it decreases to zero. A tangent to the line would look like that. So that means at 90 degrees, our gradient is going to be zero. Um, if we take a look at the gradient, it changes, 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 and then it reaches at 180 degrees, it's now minus one. 180 degrees, the gradient is minus one. Similarly, when we get to, to 270 degrees, you can see at 270, the gradient is gonna be zero again. So 270, the gradient is gonna be zero. Uh, whereas when we get back to 360, it's going to be positive one. The gradient's pointing in a positive direction. So at 360, it's going to be positive uh, one. If we did this for each of the individual points, so each of the points in between the ones we, we've looked at, then we would find that what we actually get is we actually get a graph that, that, that looks like this. Uh, connecting the dots goes to zero. At 180, it's minus 1. 
then it goes like this, goes like that, right. Let me redraw draw that nicely in color now that I've uh, put it in. So our, our gradient, it goes like this. So what we've shown is that the gradient of sine of theta, in fact, looks like this. And if you take a look at this curve, you in fact recognize it. You find that this curve shown in purple is exactly the curve of cos theta. So then this brings us to our first important uh, point or our first important uh, observation that the derivative of sine theta with respect to theta is equal to cos theta. And this is something that you should remember and always have at your fingertips. The next function we may be interested in, in differentiating is cos of theta. So we may be interested to know what is the derivative with respect to theta of cos theta. So let's go about that in exactly the same way as we did for the previous function. We can take a look at the gradient at each point. Over here, the gradient is going to be zero because the graph is, is flat. So this is going to be our first uh, point on the gradient curve. Um, when we move to 90 degrees, you can see the line is pointing uh, downwards. The slope is negative, right? And the value is going to be minus uh, 1. So over here, it's going to be minus 1 at uh, 90 degrees. As we get to, to uh, 180 degrees here, you can see the gradient is flat at 180 degrees. It's a turning point. So at 180 degrees, the, the gradient is flat. When we get to 270, we can note that our, our gradient is positive 1 at 270. So at 270, it's going to be positive 1. At uh, 360 degrees, it's going to be zero again. It's going to be zero here. So what we do then, as before, is you know we, we connect up all these uh, points, and what we get is a graph that looks like this. Looks like this, right? Let me just um, put this guy in, in color again. So this graph shown in, in pink is the derivative of our original graph cos theta. And if you look at this at this this graph, it looks a lot like sine theta except sine theta starts by heading off upwards and then going down. So this isn't a sine theta, but this is in fact minus sine of theta. This graph is minus sine of theta. So we have the important results then that the derivative of cos of theta is equal to minus sine of theta. The next important rule we need to know for differentiating trig functions is something called the chain rule. It's best illustrated by means of an example. So the example is we're given a function, x is a function of t, is equal to sine of 3t plus 6. We asked to calculate what the derivative of this with respect to, to t is. So the way we, we do this is, um, according to what we saw before, we've seen that sine, uh, of sine will become cos. So this is going to be cos of uh, 3t plus 6. Now here's where the magic comes in. We need to apply the chain rule. So the chain rule tells us that we aren't finished uh, with the, with the solution yet, what we need to do is multiply by the derivative of what's inside the bracket. I'll say we need to multiply this by the derivative of what's inside the bracket. So we need to multiply by the derivative 
of what's inside the brackets right and if we if we take the derivative of what's inside the brackets we just differentiate this normally then we can see that this is going to leave us with three so this is going to be three cos of three t plus six that's going to be our final solution let's take a look at um, another example so in this uh, second example of us applying the chain rule we asked to calculate or we given x as a function of t is eight cos of this and we asked to calculate what is dx dt so what is the first derivative with respect to t well when we when we produce the solution we should just treat the eight as a constant and then we should note that cos becomes minus sign so what we're going to have is cos will become minus sign so this will be minus sign of 3t squared plus 7t plus 2 that's fine now what we need to do is apply the 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 chain rule so the chain rule says take the derivative of what's inside the bracket so that means take the derivative take d dt of 3t squared plus 7t plus 2 and um, to finish the the answer we need to you know write it in a in its final form so this is going to be um, minus 8 we're going to have minus 8 if I evaluate take this derivative this is going to be 6 t plus 7 so it's going to be 8 times 6 t plus 7 and then I still have my sine of 3t squared as shown right the final step is just to simplify this will be is equal to um, minus 48 And then this then is our, our solution. Here's one final example for us to practice our uh, chain rule for differentiating trig functions. We given this function here and this time we asked to calculate the second derivative with respect to, to t. Well the way we do that is of course first by calculating the first derivative. So dx dt this will be equal to if we differentiate sine it just becomes cos so we'll have cos of 3t plus 6 uh, we need to remember of course to apply the chain rule so this says we need to differentiate whatever's inside the um, bracket so this will be ddt of uh, 3t plus 6 when we differentiate 3t plus 6 we can see that we left with um, just a 3 so this will be 3 cos so this is the first derivative with respect to t but in fact we asked to calculate the second derivative so we need to to take the new we need to take this function and differentiate it again so it means d squared x dt squared is equal to what I'm going to do is is write the 3 now when we differentiate cos it becomes minus sign so I'm going to put the minus there of course I need to to apply the the chain rule and the chain rule tells me to to differentiate uh, 
you know what's inside here so for this case we have what's inside is 3t plus 6 so when I evaluate this further I can see that a different differentiating this is going to give another factor of 3 so this is going to be minus 3 times 3 And of course, 3 times 3 is just a minus 9. So then we've seen three important points for differentiating trigonometric functions. Um, the first thing is that um, when we differentiate sine, it becomes cos. When we differentiate cos, it becomes minus sine. And the third point is that we need to apply the chain rule. You'll remember, we said in this chapter we're dealing with simple harmonic uh, motion. And our goal is to derive equations for the position, the velocity, and the acceleration as a function of time. Well, previously we had an equation where we came up with the acceleration as a function of position x but in this section we're interested in in knowing these three quantities as a function of time so once again we start with a uh, hooks law and newton's second law and we substitute for the sum of the forces in into um newton's second law we substitute hooks law into newton's second law which gives us this equation here but you'll note that this term over here is the acceleration in the x direction. For us to introduce the position as a function of time, we use this acceleration in the x direction. And we note specifically that acceleration can be written as the first time derivative of velocity or the second um, derivative of position, you know, with respect to time. So substituting d squared x dt squared into our equation for Newton's second law over here and re rearranging, we then get this equation um, shown here. And now for convenience, we define omega squared equal to k over m. We substitute uh, this, this into the previous equation. So instead of the, the k over m, we write omega squared and this brings us to this equation shown here where we've made this choice of omega squared equal to k over m in fact this equation shown here is a second order differential equation uh, it's called a second order differential equation because here you can see we have a second order derivative with respect to x and on this side of the equation, we just have an x. So this is a second order differential equation. And a second order differential equation of this form, it has solution x as a function of time is equal to a cos of omega t plus phi. In the next slide, we're going to show why this is a solution to this. But for now, I just take it uh, for granted that this is a solution. And what we have then is the first puzzle piece that we were trying to find, the position of the object as a function of time, x as a function of time. If we want to move on and get the velocity as a function of time, then what we need to do is take this equation and we need to find the first derivative. So the velocity is the first derivative of this with respect to time. When it comes to, to evaluating the first derivative, remember when we um, differentiate cos, it becomes minus sine. So we have this minus sine. And then we need to apply the chain rule, which is to say we need to differentiate inside here. When we differentiate inside here with respect to t, we get an extra omega term coming out. So then this is the expression for the velocity of, of the particle as a function of time, where once again we've taken the derivative with respect 
to to um, to time. When we want to find the acceleration, then we need to take the second derivative. So when we differentiate, um, so when we we need to take the second derivative. So this is to say we need to differentiate this equation again, so so that it can give us the second order derivative of x with respect to time. Well, taking the derivative, we we note that when we differentiate sine, it just becomes cos. So we have cos of omega t plus phi. There was already a minus sign here. So this minus sign uh, remains. And we need to also apply the chain rule and differentiate this. When we differentiate what's inside the brackets, we get a second um, omega term appearing. So instead of just having omega, we're going to have omega multiplied by omega, which gives us omega squared. So satisfy yourself and do the, the second order derivative and then you'll see that the acceleration is minus omega squared a cos of omega t uh, plus phi. So then this is the end of the derivation in the sense that we've come up uh, with an equation for the position and the velocity and the acceleration of our uh, uh, particle undergoing simple harmonic oscillation and they all as a function of time. You remember that I promised to prove or show that this expression here is a solution to our second order differential equation and that's what we're going to do right now. So in order to, to, to prove this statement what we need to do is we need to show that x is a function of t is a solution to the second order differential equation. So if you would like to show this, one of the ways of showing that um, something's a solution to an equation is showing that the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So on the, set, on the left hand side of our equation, we have the second uh, order derivative. So what we're gonna do is, is take the second derivative of this thing with respect to time and see what that is. Well, taking the first derivative and remembering, you know, the two important things. The first thing is that the derivative of cos uh, is minus sine. And the second important thing is that we need to apply the chain rule. Uh, it works out to be that the first derivative is given by this. If we take the second derivative, then we differentiate this once again. So differentiating this once again, um, you know, applying the chain rule, taking the signs into account, gives us that the second uh, derivative is minus omega a squared cos of omega t plus phi. So this thing is, is what the left hand side is equal to. If we want to next to check what the right hand side is equal to, you can see that that will be simple. We don't need to do any differentiation on the right hand side. All we need to do is take this expression for x and pop it in here where we see the x. And then this gives us minus omega squared x, the left hand, the right hand side, is equal to substituting in for x, that value, we get that the right hand side is equal to this expression here. And what we notice is that the left hand side is equal to this and the right hand side is equal to this and we notice that the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So this conclusively shows that um, this x of t is a solution to our second order differential equation and what we've effectively done then is we've proved this statement uh, written in blue. We've just seen that this expression here is a solution for the position of the particle as a function of time. But what we would like to do now is look at each of the individual terms that make up this expression and um, have a look at what their names are and what their relative, what the relative size of each of the terms and um, how that will influence the, the solution. So the first term we've already discussed, you know, is the amplitude. 
and the amplitude is the maximum displacement so it would be the distance from the equilibrium position to the point of maximum displacement similarly it would be the point from here to the point of minimum displacement right so that's the amplitude term the effect that the change in the, the magnitude of the amplitude will have well if you have a1 uh, being bigger than a2 uh, a big amplitude term it produces a big sign a big a big wave whereas a smaller amplitude term making it smaller it decreases the the, the size of the waves so in a sense the amplitude almost like is a magnifying uh, term the second term that we have is this omega and this is called the angular velocity so remember we chose to define uh, omega as omega squared is equal to k over m uh, and we we give it a name now the angular velocity um, the effect of the angular velocity is if you have a small angular velocity then our wave is going to vary slowly with time as shown by this wave uh, in red if you increase the angular velocity to a very large number then what you have is a quickly varying wave as shown in purple so angular velocity dictates um, how quickly or, or the, the period with which or the um, yeah how quickly the wave uh, varies with time um, I'll just like you to be aware that angular velocity is something very very different to linear velocity Remember previously we defined the or derived the linear velocity of the wave by taking the first order derivative of this whole expression the next term we should look at is a phase constant so this is this term we call phi and what a phase constant does is it shifts the um, the wave with respect to it shifts the off, offset of the wave so by choosing different uh, phase constants by choosing uh, different offsets you will be able to shift this uh, wave and you'll be able to shift this wave such that the 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 black wave might might move to the right and become uh, the red wave so it would be a good now if we can just take a moment to reflect on everything that we've derived and everything that we've defined so far and i've made some handwritten notes to to have a look at that so what we have is a mass piece attached to a spring and it's moving um, from some points it's moving you know to the left it's moving to the right and it's undergoing simple harmonic uh, motion it's uh, starting at uh, maximum offsets uh, with amplitude a this is the position of maximum offsets on this side it's going to be at, at minus a we said it has some spring constants associated to uh, to, with it the spring constant tells us how strong is the spring or how weak is the spring if it's a very weak spring k is going to be a small number if it's a strong spring uh, k is going to be you know a big number of course the the, the mass has the the block has mass m and we said what we're interested in doing is coming up with equations to predict the position and the velocity and acceleration of the block as a function of time when we took uh, Hooke's law and combined it with um, Newton's second law we came up with an equation of this form and an equation of this form uh, this is called a second order differential equation it's the derivative is taken twice with respect to to x um, we made the choice that we're going to define omega which is the angular velocity as k over m then we were able to show that this is a solution to the second order equation so this thing gave us the position as a function of time that was the first thing we were, were trying to to show um, 
as um, some notes to this equation we said that a is the amplitude or the maximum displacement from the equilibrium we said that um, omega is the angular velocity so this would be you know angular velocity would be an angular displacement divided by time and uh, we have this equation omega uh, angular displacement for one period is going to be 2 pi and the period will be t so omega is equal to 2 pi over t where t is the period remember we said that the period is the time taken for one complete uh, oscillation for the object to return to its uh, original um, position the the other term we spoke about was the the phase uh, constants which is in in effect some offset which could shift the whole cost wave you know either to the left or or to the right um, the other term that we have is the phase when we speak about the phase of the solution we're speaking about this whole omega t plus uh, phi term we have that t is defined as the period and we've already spoken about how the period is um, the time taken for one complete revolution this will be the relationship between the period and the angular uh, velocity um, for frequency we have the number of oscillations per second is is the frequency and frequency has units of hertz or per second you know frequency is the inverse of the period so frequency is 1 over cap t we have these expressions for the maximum velocity and the maximum acceleration and you can see that the maximum velocity is given by either plus minus uh, omega a let's have a look at where that, that that comes from to see where that comes from we need to to take a look back to where we found an expression for the velocity right so this was the general expression for the velocity when we're interested to know what is the maximum value that this can take on then we note that the sine of omega t plus uh, phi sine of any function can only ever be between plus one and minus one so this means that the sine term will it always be between plus one and minus one so as a result of that the velocity can never be bigger than plus minus omega t so we have the maximum velocity can be plus minus uh, omega t similarly in our expression for the acceleration we have that it depends on this expression shown here and you know this part of the expression cos of omega t plus phi that will also vary between plus one and minus one so cos of omega t plus phi can never be bigger than plus one and it can never be smaller than minus one and as a result of that the acceleration will the maximum acceleration will be plus minus omega squared uh, a so this then is an explanation of where these two two terms come from this next uh, slide is just intended to show you that there's some relation between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion so for uniform circular motion we have a point uh, moving in a circle as shown and if you take the projection of this point uh, then you find that if you project this point at each time um, then you find that the projection also varies according to a function that follows a trigonometric function such as um, cos or sine and for this reason there is a relationship between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic uh, motion so then this is a um, a summary of all the equations that we've either defined or derived in this uh, chapter what I'd like you to do is just sit for five minutes and look over each of these equations make sure that you understand where the equation comes from make sure that you understand what each of the terms in the equation in the equations are 
and make sure that you understand what their physical uh, interpretation of the terms are. Right, so here we have a problem we can look at together. A body oscillates with simple harmonic motion according to the equation x is equal to, in this expression here, where x is in meters. What is the amplitude of the oscillations and what is the frequency of the oscillations? So the way for us to tackle this problem is to, to look at the equation that, that we've been given and then to identify the various uh, terms. And doing that, we, we note that the first term we identify is the amplitude. So that's going to be the, the amplitude A. The second term we identify is omega. And then the third term we identify, this will be phi. So for part A, we asked to, to calculate what or to find out what the amplitude is and we can just say that the amplitude a is equal to six six meters and if we to give a reason for that we can just say that this is by inspection uh, the second uh, quantity that we asked to calculate what is the frequency of the oscillations so for for part B, we've been asked to find uh, the frequency. Well, we can note that we are given um, what omega is. Omega is the 3 pi, right? And we have this expression, omega is equal to 2 pi frequency. This is one of the expressions that we've seen. So we, what we can do is then we can, can rearrange this expression and then we get frequencies equal to omega over 2 pi. And for us, our frequency is 3 pi. So this will be 3 pi divided by 2 pi. The pi's cancel and we get 3 over 2. And 3 over 2 is, of course, 1.5. And for frequency, this will be either per second or hertz, which then uh, gives us our solution to this problem. The next problem we look at deals with a mass of 7 kgs, which is hung from the bottom end of a vertical spring fastened to an overhead beam. The mass is set into vertical oscillation having a period of 2 seconds and we asked to find the spring constant of the spring. Right, so this is a diagram of the situation. We have our mass piece of um, 7 kgs fastened to a beam via a spring. Uh, what's going to happen is it's going to be oscillating up and down, right? And we told that the period of oscillation, so the time taken for one full oscillation is going to be two seconds and we asked to calculate k which is you know the spring constant of the spring so the way for us to solve this problem is to note that we have two expressions for for omega the first expression comes about as the way in which it was defined it was defined as um, the square root of k over m so as a result of this, we can rearrange this and then get equation 1 for k. The second um, equation we have relating to omega says that um, omega is inversely proportional to the period t. So we can combine equation 1 and 2. I'm going to substitute this omega into equation 1. And doing that, then we left with... Um, um, we left with k is equal to 2 pi over t times the mass and you know noting that the mass is 7 kgs and that the period is 2 seconds we left with a solution of k is equal to 7 pi squared uh, newton per meter okay right so that brings us to the end of this uh, chapter 
on simple harmonic motion. <laughs> 